Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first panel discussion of our festival weekend. My name is Erica, and I'm one of the organizers of this year's Queen's Park Festival. And this is my colleague, Kate. Um, so today, um, our panel discussion is in partnership with Toronto Community Benefit Network, North York Community House, and Provocations Ideas Festival. Um, when I pass it to Kate, uh, she's going to do the line at home. Good morning, everyone. Well, we are, of course, gathered remotely online uh, in order to acknowledge that Toronto uh, is uh, located on the site of what has been a human activity since time immemorial. It is the traditional territories of the Huron Wendat, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, Confederacy, and most recently, the Mississauga Dakota First Nations. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements and is home to many Indigenous nations from across the land, including the Inuit and the Métis peoples. These treaties and other agreements, including the first performed Stone Wall Home Black Covenant, are agreements to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Other Indigenous nations, Europeans, and newcomers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of respect, peace, and friendship. We are mindful of broken covenants and we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. We recognize the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here and the ancestors on this land and the land. We recognize and support the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples and the truth and reconciliation calls to action. Thank you, Kate. Um, now I would like to introduce our moderator, Hamza Baker. He is the director of campaigns at the Toronto Community Benefits Network, a 120-member community labor coalition whose goal is to negotiate community benefits agreements as part of the new urban infrastructure and development projects in Toronto. Hamza also volunteer at various community, youth, and sports initiatives and serves on the board of the Neighborhood Legal Services in downtown Toronto. Thank you, Kumsa, for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Erica, and thank you, Kate. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning uh, with you all uh, and to moderate a, a really excellent panel uh, for the next uh, hour, hour and a half or so. Uh, my name is Kumsa. I'm with uh, an organization called the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Uh, and we're a community labor coalition. And, um, you know, today we're going to be talking uh, more about, um, you know, what's happening in Lawrence Heights. Uh, and also, uh, also uh, we have some really great panelists, which will also kind of share more about uh, the changes that they're experiencing in their own neighborhoods. Uh, and so we have uh, four awesome panelists, uh, Kyria Ahmed from uh, the Lawrence Heights community, uh, Ahmed Abdi, uh, who is from the uh, Eglinton West, uh, York Southwestern community, and uh, John Minio, uh, who is uh, both a carpenter and a next-gen builder and uh, is currently working on the Finch West LRT, and uh, Jamal Myers, uh, who is a, a resident uh, in Scarborough uh, and a community leader uh, who will all be sharing more about um, there's some of the different changes that are happening in their community and how they're experiencing it, but also how the community is organizing uh, to ensure that the actual uh, residents and those who are most impacted uh, by these changes uh, can benefit uh, from these investments. Uh, and so without further ado, I will uh, invite uh, all of the panelists to come on screen uh, and we'll have a great discussion. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Awesome. And so just to set a little bit of the context um, for this discussion today, uh, Lawrence Heights is a, a community in between. Um, and so over the last uh, few years, uh, Lawrence Heights uh, is has undergone um, a large revitalization project. Uh, for those who don't know, Lawrence Heights is a, a neighborhood that's located in North York. Um, and so over the full revitalization, uh, there'll be over 100, 100 acres um, that is going to be transformed uh, from a full Toronto community housing community into a mixed uh, income community. Uh, and that revitalization will include the replacement of 
uh, over 1,200 Toronto community housing units, uh, with also building new housing along with parks, retail uh, spaces, roads connecting yeah, Lawrence yeah. Heights and the surrounding community. Um, uh, the Lawrence Heights uh, uh, in 2020 um, started uh, the Lawrence Heights Revitalization Coalition, uh, which is a mostly a resident-led group um, that is based in Lawrence Heights. Uh, and one of the goals is, uh, for this uh, coalition uh, is to really uh, start off with a series of discussions uh, on experiences navigating through revitalization in the community. Like I mentioned, revitalization has started uh, already and uh, kind of near the midway point, almost finishing phases one. Uh, and so as the city of Toronto and Toronto Community Housing uh, start to develop plans for the next phases, how can we really take a lot of the learnings, um, you know, what's worked well, what hasn't really worked well, and how could we really ensure that uh, the tenants uh, uh, within the community, residents, are really at the forefront of the process. Uh, and so we have here with us today, Kyria, uh, who's a resident leader uh, and someone who is um, taking on a lot of that leadership role uh, within within the Lawrence Heights community. Uh, and so uh, welcome, Kyria. Hi, thank you, Kumsa. Hi, everyone. Awesome. And so I'd love to for you to get us started today um, in terms of, can you share a little bit more about yourself and your community? Uh, and also maybe share a little bit more about, um, you know, what is the change that's happening within your neighborhood in Lawrence Heights? Sure. So um, I've been doing a lot of community work. I'm a community leader. Um, I've been advocating for my community for over 10 years uh, on different areas of work, uh, but our biggest thing for the past uh, since revitalization start is the revite and how tenants like ourselves can have more ownership to what's happening in our community, right? Um, as Kumsa said, there's only going to be 1,208 units being put in to replace the TCHC units, but other than that, we're going to have at least 3,000 more units coming in, which is going to be more on a, the private aspect of it, right? So in that sense, us as a community, we're going to be losing that voice of what we want, right? If we're having almost 3,000 new people coming in, that voice for TCHC tenants is no longer going to be there because we're going to be overpowered by the private sector and the private um, tenants who come in and they get to say more of what they want it to be done within that community, right? That's one. Uh, I feel for us, as in like, for us residents, uh, we're very united, as you can say. Um, I'm also part of the Lawrence Heights Coalition, uh, which also with uh, Kumsa, who they're um, supporting us with that. Um, so with that, we're advocating for a lot of um, different areas of work where it could be like affordable home ownership for, for residents to have. Um, also the bottom up approach right for us to be at tables to have those conversation for us to make those decisions as well not for other people to make decisions for us when we're the ones who are living there on an everyday basis right so that's another thing having more work and economic opportunities um we see that those aspect of things are happening now but to be honest it's always about let's say less than 20 percent of our community got employment or just got a little bit of employment, that's it. There was nothing permanent for them. So th these are the things that we're looking at for residents in our community to have more permanent job opportunities within the revitalization with developers and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're trying to do and advocate for those things as well. Um, other things as in the green space and our environmental aspect of it, having more garden spaces, ways that we can grow our own foods to make it more sustainable for us and everything like that. Um, what else? Safety. Uh, safety is always a big issue for us. Um, we've been in the news for a long time when it comes to gun violence, but how can we change things up? And that's what we're trying to do with doing such things like a neighborhood watch. Right. So these are the different areas of work that as a community members and as residents are coming together to do these um, things slowly, but surely. Right. We just want to make it more an impact. And that way we get more community members involved, more residents to take ownership of their own community. I hope that answers your question. Kumsa. <laughs> that, that was excellent. Thank you so much for you know giving us a little bit 
uh, of a better picture about uh, yourself as well as your community. I'm always amazed by the strength and, and like you mentioned, the unity of residents coming together to take on, uh, you know, different initiatives, but also making sure that your voices are uh, centered within this revitalization process. So thank you for your leadership. And uh, yeah, I really hope to kind of continue to see that uh, over the next uh, yeah while. Okay. Um, you mentioned a really excellent point, um, you know, that I think uh, the next two speakers can kind of maybe uh, share a little bit more about um, around uh, work opportunities and good jobs within your local community. Um, you know, you mentioned that um, uh, limited opportunities for permanent uh, work uh, or good jobs within your local community. Um, and so I know um, the next speaker, Ahmed Abdi, uh, is uh, a leader within uh, the York Southwestern community uh, and is a big advocate um, uh, for getting uh, youth uh, into good jobs, uh, as well as an advocate for community benefits within your neighborhood. And so, Ahmed, do you want to uh, maybe go next and, and share a little bit more about yourself and, and your experiences uh, around community benefits and how you're really involved in your neighborhood? Uh, yes, Kumsa. Uh, as Kumsa said, my name is Ahmed Abdi. I am with the local Carpenters Union, um, uh, living on the Eglinton West, York, York Southwestern area. <clears throat> I got involved with the union through the Community Benefits, um, the Toronto Community Benefits Network. And since I've been with the uh, with the union, I have understood that these projects could actually be a good thing for the community. And if it's if we get the benefits out of it, because there's a lot of high paying jobs within the trades uh, that are associated with these projects. For example, we have the Eglinton LRT in our area, also the West Park Rehab Center. These are millions, if not billions of dollars worth of, uh, of man hours uh, when it comes to the trades and uh, work for the community. And uh, we have a lot of youth in all of our communities in, in the neighborhoods of the city that need jobs that are available to do these jobs and uh, that could benefit the community. So uh, what I discovered is uh, <clears throat> we need uh, some type of advocacy in order to, to, for the youth to get these jobs. Because uh, like uh, Korea was saying, if more people are gonna move in after these projects are done, this infrastructure projects with the subway and the hospitals and all of that. And when more people f uh, move in, the underprivileged people that already live there are gonna lose their voice. It's gonna be gentrified and people are gonna lose their homes and either they're not gonna be able to avoid the rent. And to offset that, um, if the youth get these jobs, then the community can, uh, and the people that live in the community benefit from these jobs, the community can stay in these neighborhoods after they become better. Not when they become better, they just push us away. So um, <clears throat> from what I learned through the community benefits and working at the um, on these projects, both the uh, Eglinton uh, LRT subway station and the West Park Rehab Center, um, it's a great opportunity for our community to move forward and, uh, and stay within our communities, not need to be pushed out because we can't afford to stay there anymore. <clears throat> Yeah, basically, if we wanna if we wanna benefit from these jobs that have been and these projects that are in our community, we have to get involved and we have to get these jobs. Otherwise, we'll be gentrified and pushed away. So I think this is a double-edged sword. If we need activism and we need people to push these companies in the city in order for the youth to be able to get these jobs and not. Um, not not have our community associated with gun violence and gangs and all of that because we have a lot of youth and we have a lot of willing bodies that are that need the job and that could benefit from the job and build our city together i hope that answered your question amazing yeah thank you so much ahmed uh and thank you for your continued advocacy and uh you know so supporting youth you know to follow the journey that you have uh, through the Carpenters Union into a good job um, in the construction industry. Um, next is John. Uh, John, welcome. Uh, I know you're also working, um, you know, in the in the Finch West area with the uh, Finch West LRT project. Um, can you share a little bit more about your experience, um, you know, what your community is going through, also about, um, you know, how you're really involved uh, in around community benefits uh, in your in your community? 
Oh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I started working with the Finch West LRT in 2020 or uh, October. And the reason that brought me about to working with, um, uh, working on the project, I work with the Mosaic company, which is uh, the, the main contractor for the project. Uh, so how I got to work with them is that there was uh, a, one of the um, pieces in the, in the, um, in the contract agreement was that they needed to employ a number of people from within the community where the project was being um, undertaken. So that directly forces Mosaic to work with the uh, subcontractors to make sure we have guys employed from within the community where the project is. And that's really, really the reason why, how, um, why I got involved in the project. That is a direct benefit as to, you know, like what Abdi is saying, um, other than activism, if we can get it to a policy level and make sure whichever project is being undertaken in any community, that there is an agreement with the main contractor that a percentage of the guys who are going to be giving the man hours on that project have to be from the very community where the project is being uh, built. That makes sure that um, there is direct involvement uh, with the community where the project is. Uh, those people are the very people whose uh, lives are going to be impacted by the project. And so it's important for them to just be part of um, the whole process of making sure that as their community transforms, they are also part of that transformation. Um, coming from the Jane Finch area, right now, of course, because of the construction and all that, uh, we have a lot of traffic problems and all that. But then when you're part of the project, when you are somebody from the community and you're on the project, it's easier for you to understand. And you know that, you know, it may be a challenge for a while, but after, say, a number of years, this is going to be good because somebody coming from Humber College is going to travel to Finch West Station without a problem. They don't have to be, uh, have, uh, they, they, their travel time is going to be cut down because of the project. The, the the lives of the people who work on the project from within the community, that's a huge transformation. Specifically for me, that made sure throughout the pandemic, I had employment and not just employment, but steady employment without having to worry about uh, there's a pandemic, I, I may be laid off because the project was running all the way through. Um, having said that, um, Within my community as well, there are other things that have been um, um, going on. We have like the, um, the repairs of parking garages at the TCHC buildings uh, on Sentinel Road, um, and that is that is that is really nice because when mostly the people who are living within TCHC, uh, it would be known it's low income uh, families, and just coming to the level of uh, say the city thinking, hey, these guys need um, a better parking garage. Um, it's really nice because that that shows you thinking about the people. That shows the people uh, will will see that, for especially for the ones who are working, the taxes would work for them. And then other than the project and uh, such other things as uh, the revitalization of the TCHC buildings, um, it, it has been a neighborhood that has been having so many challenges in, in terms of uh, gang violence. And even in, in the city of Toronto, if you ask anyone where you're coming from and, and they tell you Jane Finch, right there and then they will start telling you, uh, thinking or telling you how you're living in an unsafe neighborhood. This is my home. So where am I going to run to? I'd rather stay and be part of uh, the building of the community, be part of the advocacy for the opportunities for young people because these opportunities are the ones that are going to be helping us young people uh, transform our lives from the lives that people otherwise have thought we live to another side of life of us having something that can take care of our families. Wow, so powerful, John. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. I, I think, you know, it could give us a little bit of a better picture of what's happening in the Finch West LRT. And, and it's so amazing to hear your experiences, um, you know, being able to work through the pandemic and, you know, have a good steady job, um, you know, within your local community. I, I think it's 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 really, really uh, powerful to hear that. Thank you for sharing. Um, next, uh, last but not least, Jamal. Um, so I, I think we've heard from a couple of speakers, uh, you know, who are under experiencing change in their neighborhood, you know, through 
uh, LRT uh, projects that are kind of uh, midway or, or kind of ending. Uh, I know for you in Scarborough, you're just at the beginning stages of, of a, a you know transformational LRT project, um, and and also a lot of growth uh, within Scarborough. So um, it's really great to have you here with us today, and uh, really want to hear more a little bit more about you know what are some of the changes that uh, you're experiencing in Scarborough, and and um, you know also uh, please feel free to share more about yourself and and some of the work that you're involved in in your community. Uh, thanks, Kunta, and thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Jamal Myers. I was born and raised in Scarborough. Uh, I grew up in Toronto community housing in Scarborough, first at Birchmount and Eglinton, and then at Cataraki Crescent. I was raised by a single mom who raised me and my brother. Uh, and I grew up in Toronto back in the 80s and 90s when even if you were poor, you still had a lot of opportunity in the city because the city was relatively still affordable. Uh, we had access to good transit. We had access to good schools. Uh, and I was able to take advantage of those opportunities to do well for myself. Uh, and eventually I went to law school uh, and I worked uh, in New York actually for four and a half years as a corporate lawyer uh, before I finally decided that, you know, I wanted to come home and help create opportunities back home for people like me uh, that I could see really needed them. So I moved back uh, to Toronto, actually Scarborough. Uh, back in February 2018, and I moved in with my grandma, who was a widow at the time, and we live right at 401 in Nielsen. And, you know, one day I was taking her to her doctor's and we had to cross the street and she couldn't cross it because there was no crosswalk. Uh, and for me, it was something so simple. I mean, I've, my grandmother's lived in this house since 1969. And we, I've crossed this street thousands of times, and I've never noticed that there was no crosswalk until I saw it through someone else's eyes. And that made me realize sort of how we all experience our city so differently from one another and why it's so important that we have these diverse voices and lived experiences at the decision making table. So from that one experience that sort of spawned my activism into transit organizing uh, after New York, I had taken a sabbatical and took a year off. Um, and I became a transit activist with a group called Scarborough Transit Action. And we were actually organizing for better transit in Scarborough, particularly that the um, seven stop LRT would be built instead of the Scarborough subway. Um, from that, uh, my activism sort of spawned into different areas, including affordable housing, uh, local, and econ local economic development and health. Um, currently I am a a senior lawyer at TD Bank, and I work in environmental and social governance issues. Uh, and I'm also, that includes climate change, um, helping to grow our economy inclusively, and, you know, making sure that uh, the bank's diversity and inclusion initiatives are actually uh, doing what they're supposed to do. Um, but back to the activism, we were very conscious of the fact that Scarborough transit riders in particular had been let down so many times. We've had so many promises of so many different ideas of, you know, what's supposed to be good for Scarborough that we never actually have people from Scarborough who take transit making those decisions. Uh, so fast forward uh, four years, and currently we're in this situation where, you know, thankfully something is being built, the Scarborough subway to replace the Scarborough RT. Uh, which will shut down in 2023. Um, currently, there isn't a well thought out plan as to what to do um, with the replacement bus st shuttle service that will have to take the approximately 30,000 people a day who take the RT to work on a weekday. Um, the TTC is still working that out. Uh, the Scarborough subway will not be built for another 10 years. So we're actually, you know, we have the longest commutes in the city and they are set to get even longer next year once the RT shuts down. So, you know, this obviously is not a great situation, but, you know, from this, uh, from this came an opportunity. Um, so when the province decided that they were going to build the subway, uh, Toronto had raised approximately $1.25 billion dollars. Um, for its share of the subway. And with that money now not needed to build the subway, we were able to organize uh, and assemble a coalition of the community to really push to make sure that that money was then allocated to building the Eglinton East LRT, which is Scarborough's other priority project. And that project is important because it would bring rapid transit to two post-secondary campuses, the University of Toronto Scarborough and Centennial College Morningside and to Malvern. 
And, you know, we were successful in February 2021. So that was a big win for our, our, our community. Uh, currently, what we're trying to do is we are, I'm a director of the Scarborough Business Association, and we are trying to work with Toronto Community Benefits Network, among other organizations, also the East Scarborough Storefront, to ensure that, you know, people are given from our community are given jobs to build the Scarborough subway and not just construction jobs, administrative jobs, financial jobs, any types of jobs that are created. And we're also looking for social procurement opportunities so that we can ensure that some of the goods and services that are used from the Scarborough subway uh, that are used to build some of the Scarborough subway come from local businesses. And that's really what we've been organizing and pushing for. And, you know, we've made some good headway so far, uh, but now we're really trying to push it to, like John said, get these policies implemented into writing. Um, however, one of the challenges of building the Scarborough subway instead of the original seven stop LRT is that now we're also trying to build uh, affordable housing, affordable housing in transit oriented communities. Uh, one of the benefits of building the LRT over the subway was that just that it would, there was more space. Uh, so there would be more land that would be open up for development so that you could build sort of these compact rapid transit communities. Um, unfortunately, with the Scarborough subway, there's less land to build it on. So the towers uh, to build affordable housing have to be higher um, because of the restricted land. Uh, this has caused a lot of community opposition. Um, a lot of these subways are located in very suburban areas and, you know, homeowners generally don't like um, 30, 40, 25 story towers going up in their neighborhoods. Uh, and especially they don't like it when they find out that a significant portion of these homes will be given to people um, that are in, need of, are in need of housing. And this housing is for people making between 21 to $50,000 $50, a year. Uh, but it still elicits a lot of opposition. So that's some of the work that we've been doing, uh, trying to get these homes built and trying to ensure that there's this community benefits agreement in place for building, uh, you know, the Scarborough subway. And, you know, this whole experience has really helped motivate me to, you know, decide to throw my hat in the ring and run for city council to make sure that, uh, you know, our experiences and our people are really represented at the decision-making table. That's so amazing, Jamal. Thank you so much for sharing, and, and it's so it's so great to hear, uh, you know, many of the different advocacy initiatives that you're involved in, and you know, working alongside the residents of your community. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, I guess we're gonna segue back uh, to Hyria. Um, I think there were some good uh, themes that were brought up by Jamal around uh, affordable housing. Um, you know, promises you know that are made that sometimes are not fulfilled. Um, I know, you know, as a resident leader in uh, Lawrence Heights, uh, you're very involved with the, you know, phases one, you know, with uh, revitalization and, um, you know, can you maybe share a little bit more about, you know, your experiences as a, le as a leader in the community uh, through phases one, um, you know, what, what were some of the promises that were made to the community, um, you know, have they been fulfilled yet, have you been able to um uh learn from i guess that that whole experience is you know what could you share with others i guess in, in this uh, discussion today in terms of you know that experience as a residents kind of going through that first phases of revitalization and and maybe with that you can talk about the sdp and maybe some of the community the the, the need for community spaces that have come up a lot sure no worries um so for us when it comes to the revitalization especially in phase one um there were a lot of promises uh, that were made. Some were fulfilled, but not most of them. Uh, the good thing out of it that we were able to get through the developers through that was scholarships for the residents in our community when they wanted to go back to school or to do some type of training. It doesn't matter if you were a youth or an adult, uh, you go through a process, you apply for it. And we gave uh, they gave out at least uh, 15 scholarships each year for the past four years. Um, so that was a benefit where it gave um, residents that opportunity to go back to school. They were given a scholarship of $3,000 towards that, which was good. Um, we were also given promises as in home ownership. But when it comes to, as um, Jamal was talking about, when it comes to home ownership and stuff like that, out of our whole community, especially in phase one, only less than five people actually 
had that opportunity of home ownership, which is sad uh, because of the amount of money that you had to put down as a down payment and all that process of that where a lot of residents didn't have that type of money to put down as a down payment and everything like that. And there was a lot of um, criteria that you had to follow for you to have that. So, um, and I think the education piece also would have came uh, great with that before um, d um, letting residents know that you have that opportunity, even if for residents to plan themselves, we never got that opportunity as well. Um, so from there, um, now we've actually partnered up with a nonprofit organization who are also supporting us with how we can advocate for home ownership for for us residents um, we're looking for something more than not just 10 percent of the residents we're looking for something more than at least to 50 percent of the community if they're interested in home ownership how would that look like and what do we as residents need to do to get that into our community so that way we can do that with our next developers and everything like that with the support and help of toronto toronto benefit network that's which is great they're supporting us with that through our Lawrence Heights uh, coalition group, we're really advocating for a lot of that. Um, so, and a lot of the residents are all on board. They're willing to do their part. Uh, but now it's just having those conversations sitting down as most of you are saying that we need to have something concrete, written, promised. So that way we can take that forward and, and do that. Um, when it comes to spaces in our community, as tenants, as residents of the community, we have no access to that, right? And even if they are there, um, it takes a long time. We have to na navigate through a lot of like robes, hoops and all that before we can even get that spaces, right? Uh, for myself, I would say for our community right now, uh, I've been advocating for food security for us to get like a space for food hub space where we can support the residents, where we can have education pieces as in learn to grow our own food to make it more sustainable and all that. And we're ha having a hard time just doing that. For the past, since COVID started, I've been advocating for space until today, I would tell you, it's disappointing, we're not able to get space. And imagine we're going through a revitalization and through TCHC, we have a lot of acre of land in our community. There are a lot of spaces. We as residents, as tenants, we can't get space, which is really sad. Um, and so that that's that's the thing with us. And for us residents, it's, it's very discouraging because we're trying our best to do a lot of things for our community, but we're always, there's always some type of red tape that we can't get there, right? But it doesn't stop us. Uh, Kumsa has worked with us. He knows that we really work hard and no matter if there's any type of red tape, we try to figure out, navigate through it. Sometimes it won't happen today, tomorrow, but eventually it would happen, so. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that, Kyria. Um, and uh, just a quick plug for those who want to uh, learn more about the Lawrence Heights community. There is going to be a Jane's Walk uh, today at 3 p.m. Uh, and so feel free to join uh, that walk and, and you'll learn more in, uh, about the community and um, hear more about some of the, the resident leaders, uh, you know, who are really taking um, ownership uh, of their community and, and really trying to make sure that you know, with the next phases of revitalization that, you know, these important priorities are uh, included uh, as part of that process. Um, Next, uh, I'll go back to uh, Ahmed and John. Um, I know, uh, John, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, your, your community is undergoing a lot of change uh, and a lot of construction happening, you know, so increased traffic, you know, other things like that. Um, and so uh, maybe, uh, John, yeah, can you share a bit more about, you know, what, what other experiences that you've, you know, seen around uh, transit development in your community, um, other, uh, you know, you know, from day to day, like, you know, how like, has your life really changed much? Like, you know, what has that experience been? Um, you know, we hear a lot about, um, you know, Eglinton uh, project um, where it's had a lot of impact on businesses in the community, especially in, in areas like Little Jamaica. Um, and so, like, I guess for a resident in the community, can you kind of share a bit more of that? You know, what has that experience have been like? You know, have you noticed uh, uh, those type of changes um, or other type of changes? Uh, thank you, Kursa. Um, uh, there are changes, of course. Uh, the changes are bittersweet. So 
uh, when there was like free flow of traffic before the transit project, probably you know the shops were um, were more accessible. Uh, it's hard when you have to make a turn and you need to get something from a shop, and then the turn is closed because of construction. So it's it's both good and bad, and and bad in the sense of uh, reduced accessibility to maybe people's favorite shops or uh, stores. And good in the sense that the people working on the project, most of them are going to buy stuff from the shops where they are working. So that again is uh, is is a good change. Other than that, we uh, the Fintrust LRT comes with um, with uh, uh, services like um, accessibility for 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 people, like the crosswalks and all that. They they've been nicely uh, been factored into the project such that what um, we've been experiencing before, you're supposed to cross a road like one of us has shared, but then there is no crosswalk. So that was very clear that the project had to really, really be clear about it, that there were clear crosswalks for, for, for pedestrians. And not just that, but there's going to be a clear, uh, there's, there's going to be clear bicycle lanes as well. So that is really, really nice, not throughout the whole project, at some sections, which is really nice. It's better than nothing. We know we are, have, we are in a problem, in a situation where um, the, the drivers on the roads are not sharing the roads with, with the pedestrians and the cyclists. So that has been resulting in lots of accidents and the project having factored that in is, is really, really nice. The changes are enormous. Uh, the amounts, of, it, it, when you look at economic um, empowerment or the the, the factors that would propel a community to grow economically, transport is one of them. And so once you reduce the amount of time, the, 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 the amount of time somebody uses to move from uh, point A to point B, it means they have more time to concentrate on other things they would otherwise use for, say, uh, economic gain. If somebody is traveling from the Jen Finch area to the west around Hamburg, maybe they were using... 40 minutes before now they can use 20 minutes they have an extra 20 minutes either to get a good rest or to to do to do some uh, more extra work which means more income so for the moment the challenges could be could seem to be limiting in the sense that maybe the travel time is more because of the close some closed exits and reduced lanes but in the long term the change is going to be positive because the community itself we are the ones who are going to benefit from this we may not see it right now, and this has helped me really to grow because one of the things people will ask you, uh, they see you probably, if somebody gets to know you're working on that project, the first question is, hey, are you guys even going to be done? So when somebody asks you that and they're asking you from the point of them not being part of the active construction of the project, yet you have been there, you see how things are, and you know you are making progress every day, you are in a position of telling them, yes, there could be challenges now, but yes, we are making progress. We are not where we were yesterday. Tomorrow is different because you have been there. You are experiencing it. You are seeing the growth. When you pour uh, concrete yesterday, you know you'll not pour that concrete again. You have grown. You have moved. So at some point, things are going to look uh, much better. Like for my example, the first project I did on the Finch West LRT was um, the maintenance and storage facility at Jen Finch, just west of York Get Mall. That is almost... Uh, finished right now and the project uh, where I'm working right now is is uh, the last uh, last station at uh, at Hamba College that is also the the work we are supposed to do there is almost going to be done in in the next three four months and then we leave the rest to the other trades to finish up um, waterproofing whatever uh, electricity and, and all that stuff because I do concrete form work I'm a carpenter so we do much of the the, the skeleton of the construction That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, John. I know uh, that that's uh, probably Toronto's number one joke is when the uh, LRT projects will be uh, completed. Um, so thank you for sharing more uh, on that. Um, I think we may have dropped Ahmed, uh, and so I'll jump to Jamal. Uh, and and yeah, like uh, Jamal, I was hoping that uh, maybe you can share a little bit more about. Um, looking forward, um, I, I, as your community is changing, I guess like maybe to share, um, you know, what are some of the key, those key priorities uh, for your community moving forward? 
um, you know, I, I think there's lots of, like you mentioned, lots of growth uh, in Scarborough coming from the, the new subway investment. Um, and, and so, yeah, just like, you know, what is the hopes and aspirations for your community? Like, what would what would be ideal for you to see, uh, you know, Scarborough look like as, as they experience that growth? So um, I would say first it would be to take the lessons learned from the Eglinton Crosstown. Um, so the Eglinton Crosstown also went into Scarborough through the Golden Mile to Kennedy Station. And there were a lot of lessons learned from that project in terms of the damage that it did to the local business community. Uh, many businesses before COVID were suffering. Uh, Metrolinks did not listen to them when they said customers couldn't access their restaurants. Uh, Metrolinks did not compensate them when Metrolinks's property damaged their either their drive-ins or uh, took up the sidewalk or caused damage to customers' vehicles, for example. Uh, and this was an ongoing complaint uh, that we found and that really soured a lot of people on, you know, LRTs in Scarborough and building these sort of large scale uh, construction transit projects above ground. So I think we would have to really take those lessons learned and apply them to the Scarborough subway and eventually to the Eglinton East LRT. So I would say before any major construction projects are started, we really have to make sure the community is involved and not just involved in terms of there's an advisory committee and, you know, we get to meet once a, meet, um, a month and let P Metrolinx or whatever organization know what's going on but that the community is actively involved in the decision-making process from the beginning. Um, so just one quick example, um, the TTC, uh, in order to compensate for the fact that the Eglinton East LRT will not be built in the near future, decided to create an express bus lane along Eglinton East from Kennedy up to University of Toronto Scarborough. You know, great idea. The plan was a success from the point of view that it has cut commute times. Unfortunately, it did that by cutting local bus stops without consulting the community first. So a lot of people, uh, especially elderly people, people with disabilities, um, children, where it might now take faster to uh, get from Kennedy to University of Toronto, Scarborough, it takes longer to get to the actual bus stop. So you're actually negating a lot of the progress that you made because you didn't consult the community first. And we really need to take those lessons and really build them into the policies. So, you know, going forward, uh, what I'd really like to see uh, for the Scarborough subway and for the Islington East is a strong community benefits agreement. Um, an agreement that stipulates that a certain percentage of the jobs created have to come from residents living in Scarborough, particularly, particularly in our priority neighborhoods, such as Malvern, um, Steele's Lamaru, uh, Millican, Agent Court, really areas that are dealing with a lot of hidden poverty and an unemployment. Uh, and that's one of the things about poverty in Scarborough. It's very hidden. You don't see people necessarily begging on the streets, but there are a lot of illegal rooming houses. There are a lot of people in unstable housing situations that really doesn't get captured by a lot of the local decision makers. Um, the second thing is, you know, as a director of the Scarborough Business Association, I heard time and time again how, you know, businesses were basically devastated, not just by the pandemic itself, but by the government's response to it, i.e. they let Walmart stay open, but they were forced to close. Uh, they let Canadian Tire stay open, but they were forced to close. You know, same thing. And the, a lot of these businesses took on so much debt and they're basically hanging on by a thread. Uh, and it's really incumbent uh, upon policymakers that when these projects are built, that a certain percentage of the revenue are given to these local businesses, because this means steady local revenue for however long the project is being built. Uh, and the good thing about local businesses, is not just that they're local, is that they tend to hire local as well. So if you're a Scarborough based company, generally a large percentage of your employees are going to come from Scarborough. Um, so I'd say that. And then the third thing really is making sure that we are reforming the affordable housing process in Toronto. Um, you know, one of the uh, highlights, I guess, of my community activism work has been really helping Housing Now to reform the process by which it engages communities about uh, affordable housing projects. 
Uh, so before, when there was an affordable housing project, what they would do is they would take a bunch of flyers and give them and drop them off in the mailboxes of the local homeowners. So within a 200 meter radius. And then predictably, obviously what would happen is that you would get a bunch of angry homeowners that would show up to a meeting saying they've never heard of this. They don't want this. This is going to block their view, uh, create, you know, shadows, block sunlight, etc. And that's why Toronto has really struggled. A big reason why Toronto's really struggled to get these grounds, these projects off the ground is that there's always so much local opposition at these meetings. Uh, you know, and it took one of these meetings where I went to and I just started like really questioning them, like, who are you engaging in these conversations? Are you reaching out to the, you know, the communities that are tr the organizations that are trying to get people housed in Scarborough? Are you reaching out to people on the TTC? Are you reaching out to people in the libraries and the rec centers? Or are you just reaching out to people that are living in homes who, by definition, generally won't need affordable, <laughs> affordable housing because they already have housing? And, you know, really, uh, to the city's credit, they really reform their process to make sure that there's that wider, more reflective voice of the community that's heard at these meetings and that's invited to these meetings. So I'm excited. I'm optimistic that, you know, between the, the lessons learned in the, the um, Eglinton Crosstown and the reforms that the city has built into the affordable housing process, that we're actually going to get good transit built that creates jobs, uh, creates opportunities for local businesses, and that will, once those projects are built, will allow us to open up that land for affordable housing development. Um, and that because we're now inviting a wider swath of the community to participate, we're actually going to get a more reflective decision because we've heard from more people. So that I'm optimistic about this future of Scarborough. I always am, uh, but that's just my take. <laughs> That's that's so great to hear. Um, you know some of that important groundwork that's needed to be done to really you know make sure that you know voices within the community are involved uh, as part of these important decision making. And you know, like you said, lots of transit, but also lots of housing opportunities to be built around this transit. And you know, the the key thing is you know um, how do you do it right, uh, and how do you make sure that um, you know all voices in the community are are are, are there, and and that um, you know they're really helping to shape. Um, you know what that uh, affordable housing development looks like, which is which is really important. Um, Ahmed, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, I know you dropped off there quickly a little bit, um, but uh, I was hoping uh, if you can share uh, for yourself and in, in your community, um, you know what is one thing that you hope for the future. Um, you know, I know Mount Dennis, York Southwest, and you know as the LRT completes, uh, lots of you know development coming to your neighborhood. Um, and, and so for you in your, in your community, you know, what, what is, you know, maybe one or two things that you would say is like, uh, important priority for you, uh, you know, moving forward or, or looking forward. Uh, sorry about that guys. Technology is a double edged sword. <laughs> um, the, one of the more, uh, pressing things that I uh, would love to see uh, accomplished is obviously with the help of the Toronto community benefits to have legislation or policy written down where these companies have to stick to and not just promise where um, <clears throat> where a specific percentage is is not only promised to the community but they have a mechanism where they could get pleased that these numbers that are actually they actually promised are being are being offered to the community and um, basically just more in writing. So most of these corporations, they could say one thing and then to turn around in a couple of months and say, oh, well, it's not feasible or this happened, that happened. But <clears throat> what I want to see in the future is like a model where they have um, CPAs at the core of every project in the community. That way the community can actually benefit from it and moving forward, um, nobody is left out and people, the construction and um, Infrastructure is a great way to lift people out of poverty, poverty, because most of the people that work on construction sites are not from our neighborhoods. Um, majority of them are not from the city of Toronto, but yet they have the highest paying jobs in the city. So, so it makes no sense why, while we have the projects going in our community, all that money flowing through and we're not getting a dime out of it. So in the future, I would love to see, um, like John said earlier and Jamal and Korea, um, legislation 
in the books where they can't go around it or some type of rules and mechanism where they can't go around it like they have in Newfoundland, I believe, in Nova Scotia now. Um, so community benefits at the forefront of every project. And that can be achieved if the community gets involved, as I learned, uh, at the beginning of these projects when they're having community consultations and st like at the start of the projects. We need to have our voices heard at the start of the project. So later on, we are not just jumping in when everything, the decisions already have been made. So start from the beginning and have some kind of a policy legislation written down where they can not flip flop. Thank you, Kumsa. Those are very great recommendations. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for sharing. Um, John, uh, for you, um, what, um, could you share a little bit about um, for you or your community, um, you know, one or two parties that you have going forward? I know uh, Finch West LRT is um, kind of midway through, maybe a little bit further. Uh, but um, yeah, I would love to hear more about for you and your community. Sorry, go over that again. Just in terms of uh, yourself or your community, like looking forward into the future, um, like uh, I know you said that transit will be completed soon. Uh, and so, you know, I, I guess for, you know, are there any priorities for you or your family or, you know, for those in your community that you want to see? Like, what do you hope the future of your, your Jane and Finch community to look like? Um, you know, what would you, you know, what were the type of things you would want to see in your community? Oh, all right. Thanks a lot. Um... As a member of this community, of course, what, what I'm looking forward to is there's been some um, involved, some level of involvement uh, uh, to to some extent, like, you know, having uh, people, young people from the community being employed by the transit, um, the construction companies building the project. But then at the end of the project, that should not be the end of building the community through their own project. Uh, the transit's gonna need operators, the transit's gonna need uh, uh, maintenance guys, the transit's going to need uh, uh, inspectors. There's going to be like so much uh, job opportunities that are coming up once the project is done. Uh, I'm hoping there can be say a drive uh, in, the, in, the, in the community to say, hey, the transit is coming to an end and we have this uh, opportunities coming up, go to this link, uh, make your application there and all that. Say maybe having flyers uh, distributed in the community and, and, and guys are able to get the information firsthand. Sometimes what happens is probably the adverts, the job adverts would be made on the TTC websites and uh, maybe just a few people who can access that or who have that knowledge can actually get to know of those uh, uh, opportunities. But then if we can translate that into active communication in the neighborhood with with the knowledge with the knowledge that once we share this with them, then there's a young man, there's a young lady somewhere who's going to know about this and they may actually be interested and apply for it. Then that's going to increase the community's uh, contribution to the project after it's uh, completed, uh, the, the build is com completed. And sort of the the returns from the project are going to start building the very community where the project is uh, that would be my very simple hope for the near future that is a, a great reminder and and thank you for for sharing that um you know that's always you know the long-term opportunities that come out of you know the, these uh, projects like you mentioned the maintenance the operations all of those are also going to be long-term jobs in the community and you know, how do we make sure that, you know, local residents within those communities get access to those, you know, good jobs like TTC is, you know, a good unionized, you know, career. Um, uh, and so um, I think that's a definitely and, and I hope you're uh, going to be involved in, in supporting with some of that advocacy and, and making sure that your neighbors and people in your community are involved in, in uh, you know, raising awareness about that. Because, you yeah, know, like you mentioned, those are good, good long term opportunities and careers that, you know, are available within the, the neighborhood. Okay, awesome. I know we're going to take questions soon. And so if anyone has questions, feel free to use uh, the chat box and to ask your question. Uh, before we do that, though, I know, Kyria, um, we have you uh, last year for uh, the final question. Uh, so for you and your community, uh, what do you hope for the future? Um, you know, what are the priorities for you or your family? And I know Lawrence Heights is um, currently, uh, you know, starting phases two soon. 
Uh, I know the planning is underway by the city already. Um, and so uh, maybe share like one or two things that, you know, what are the most important things to you or, or, or uh, your community that you want to see uh, the future um, Lawrence Heights uh, um, community look like? Um, so I think for us, what, number one has always been a, a community hub space where it's uh, for us to have, where which we don't have. And uh, through the different level of governments, that conversations has always been there. But um, right now that we are in Revite, we haven't seen, seen any any movement on that or any steps taking to that. So hopefully in the next phase, that would be our number one thing is like a community hub space. Um, second, I would say is like job opportunities uh, for the community. When I say job opportunities, having more job, it's not just in the trades, but also helping residents who have small businesses have access to storefront in our community to have those small businesses uh, within our community. Um, what else? I would say home ownership. Those are, I think, the, our biggest main three um, areas that we want to see our community because uh, we don't want to be all about low income, low income, low income, right? We also want to show that we can be sustainable. We can make it as long as we're given the opportunity, we can come off of that. But without giving an opportunity, how can we do that, right? So those, I think, are our biggest thing. We do have a lot of residents who have talent, who have passion, who want to have those opportunities, but they're not giving, being given to us. Or even if they are, it's not realistic, right? So the other thing is it has to be realistic, right? Like even if someone wants to have their own business, you can't tell us they need to have a certain amount of down payment, which is maybe they can at the moment or have this and that and all these criterias, but you're not giving residents an opportunity to even start something, right? So I think those are my biggest three main areas I think would for, for the future. Oh, wow, that was so powerful, and I, I think what a great way to uh, end the the questions uh, for the panel. Um, so thank you, Kharia. Thank you, Jamal, uh, Ahmed, and and John. Um, I wonder if there's any questions that have come in uh, that we can ask uh, our panelists. Uh, so we have a question here from Wesley, um, and so the question is: Are there any solutions to the community opposition? Um, and so um, I'm guessing that's in relation to uh, some of the different uh, housing or affordable housing developments um, that are happening. I, I think that I may, may have been referring to. Um, any Anyone want to take on that question or, or maybe share um, uh, how you're involved in fighting some of the opposition to you know development in your community? It's kind of a tough one. Jamal? Uh, so I'll do my best. Um, so I think what Kiera said was so important that, you know, when we talk about affordable housing, it's not just, you know, low income housing. It's about home ownership. It's about building wealth in communities, making sure that you can pass wealth on to you, the next generation of your family. And it's really important to get that message across that when we talk about affordable housing, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about low income housing. We're talking about uh, rental housing. But we're also talking about affordable home ownership. And I think that really matters. Uh, and it really helps change the nature of the conversation. I also think, you know, going back to what I was saying, making sure that there's a wider reflection of the community uh, at these meetings, uh, at these meetings where a lot of the decision making is uh, done or a lot of the feedback is received is so important because if you've ever gone to one of these housing now meetings, you'll see the same people over and over and over and over and over again. It is people that own homes that don't really understand the project. Um, they aren't necessarily opposed to affordable housing per se. They might be opposed to it next to their house. Um, but what they're really, um, what, they're, what the real issue is a lot of the times is they're just not other voices that are heard at these, you know, community meetings. Uh, there's just the same people over and over and over again. And I know that, you know, it's often hard for people in need of housing to attend these meetings for a bunch of reasons. They might not have internet connection. They might not know when the meeting is happening. They might not feel uh, confident or empowered to speak up at these meetings. 
but I cannot emphasize just how important it is to show up, to speak, uh, that your voice matters, uh, that what you're saying is important, and that if you don't show up, nobody else is going to show up for us. So it's important that you get involved uh, and that you make sure that you make a point of speaking up at these meetings uh, and making sure that that experience, those, those um, voices are heard at the meetings. Because once people generally see that there are other people on these calls that are actually in need of housing uh, and that you know want the housing, the conversation generally tends to become a lot more respectful. Um, it's just when, you know, there's just opposition after opposition after opposition, people become a lot more emboldened to say things that they wouldn't otherwise say. That is awesome. Thank you so much for, for responding. And I think that's a, a really excellent approach. Um, we have another question from Meg, uh, who asks, what is the attitude from developers to CBAs in Toronto? To me, it only makes sense to have community support and sustainability in their projects. Uh, thoughts? Um, anyone want to take that? Um, Ahmed? Yeah, um, you got to push them. They're not re very uh, receptive of the idea. They, um, they like the idea, but they don't want to do the work uh, to get to that point. They need a push. Uh, if they were receptive of the idea of having CPAs uh, and all the projects would not be having these type of conversations right now. So um, they know the need for it, but they're not going to mention it because uh, it complicates their bottom line at the end of the day. So you need you need uh, an advocacy group or somebody to put the uh, how do you say it? to put them to the test that way um, that way they're they come forward uh, or they're receptive to the idea of uh, CPAs. They're not just going to, uh, um, like Jamal said, um, you need uh, you need to have some type of advocacy and you need to get at these people. Otherwise, they're not just going to pick it up from the table and you're not at their meetings, so nobody's there in their meeting uh, advocating for CPAs. So you do need, you do need to... Um, push them to the idea of accepting CPAs. They know the need for it, but they're not just gonna magically say, hey guys, let's uh, let's be all inclusive. Somebody needs to push them to the, to the idea. And another thing on that also, just to add, make sure when you're going attending these meetings or you're pushing developers for certain decision-making that you're not alone, right? It's not just you or it's just not me making those decisions and talking for community. Uh, developers and anyone who have in such power need to see people there, that you guys are there together as a group, as a unity, right? So if I'm there talking for my community, but nobody's there to support me and say, hey, we back her up or we back him up, right? Uh, nothing is going to get done. They're just going to listen to you, of course, but that's all they're going to do. But the more people you have, every time you have meetings, have new members coming into those meetings, then eventually they'll make those changes, right? But without that, honestly, it's all about numbers for them to see that these are the people in the community. This is the change that they want for their community, right? So I think that's also important. That is amazing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing power and numbers. That's always, you know, um, you know, the key and, and, you know, development is all about power, right? The developers have all the money, they have all the resources. Um, and so far as community, like coming together, I think that shows that the community also has power, you know, in, like you said, in, in unity. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, I don't know if we have any qu additional questions. Um, uh, any final comments? Anyone want to make any final comments? I think it's been a, a great discussion today. I really uh, appreciate you all being here to share more uh, about your experiences and and also for those attending to uh, also hear more about what's uh, happening in, in, in different neighborhoods and, and how community benefit agreements can really, you know, ensure that these transformational pro projects and investments uh, into communities actually benefit those local communities. and uh and residents that are living uh in these areas john yeah i just just uh love to give some final comments uh in regards to my own experience and uh 
to somehow bring in how uh, TCBN, uh, to be specific, comes in. Uh, I got to know TCBN through through a friend uh, when the, the project to just uh, track the growth of the young guys who had just gotten into construction was being launched. So some of the challenges the young uh, people from uh, the, the communities where I come from are experiencing is when you are jobless, you don't have something to depend on, then you get a job, say, through the way I got a job into Local 27, you're a carpenter, you start growing. That is apprenticeship. So along the way, uh, you are required to stop work and go back to school for three periods of uh, uh, eight weeks each. So if you had started working, you are already earning and then you have recurrent expenditures for your family, for yourself and family. And then you're required to stop work and go back to school. Most of the people from my community experience the challenges, uh, these challenges to, to, to such, some levels, uh, impeding them to go back to school. Because if you are getting $20 an hour and then you're supposed to go back to school and maybe after the eight weeks of schooling, you can get uh, $25 an hour most of us may choose to stay on $20 an hour because you cannot afford to stay off work. Whereas you would have been able to go to school and come back with a better pay, you're better off staying on your current pay and not get the raise because you cannot afford to be off work. And so TCBN has come in so uh, greatly in terms of supporting such young talents and making sure those transitions between one level of apprenticeship to the next level is not as harsh. There are supports that are coming in to young, young people, to the people in, in the trades. Uh, at the moment, uh, to such levels as uh, getting, say, uh, union, union uh, registration membership, uh, the monies you need to pay for um, uh, the schooling, uh, tools that uh, somebody may need, groceries during that period of schooling. And so such things are, are, are really helpful to, to, to such people who have to break off work, go to school and come back without having to greatly uh, negatively affect them uh, uh, to the, in, in terms of how they support their families. And so my wish is that uh, TCBN, uh, you know, they, they get more resources for such. And other than that, we can get like more organizations that are geared towards helping uh, the people who are getting into the trades from the very communities where these projects are, not to slacken along the way, not to give up. Uh, we have had such things as uh, uh, really work ethic trainings with TCBN. Some of, some of us are coming from uh, environments where no one is training you to arrive on time. No one is training you. Um, uh, sorry, guys, just a moment. No one is training you uh, that you need to respect another person. You're probably coming from a family where uh, you've not been given instructions by anyone. You've li literally been trying to figure out your own life. So there are some things, some tricks that people, uh, us young people getting into the trades need to be taught. And so TCBN has come in really handy. And the, the wish and prayer is that there could be more organizations or uh, more expansion within TCBN for more people to, to receive such assistance. Uh, to make sure that they don't just get into this, uh, uh, they don't just use these job opportunities, but they can sustain themselves within the opportunities that are available. Very well said, John. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. I, I think it's uh, really helpful, helpful advice, you know, that, you know, we all can take back and, and like you mentioned, like, um, you know, really helping to grow the network. And so for those of you who are in attendance, uh, if you're part of a community group or an organization, um, or even just trying to like learn more about how to get involved in your community around development, um, definitely connect with uh, TCBN, our website communitybenefits.ca, um, and you can register to get connected. If you know people in your community that are looking for, you know, uh, getting on the pathway to uh, careers in the in construction trades or uh, businesses that are looking to get access to procurement opportunities. Uh, feel free to also connect uh, uh, to the TCBN through our website and uh, we would be happy to sort of uh, see how, you know, you can get more involved with uh, the network that's, you know, constantly growing uh, across the city. Um, final plug for today. Um, 
there is going to be a, a Jane's Walk uh, happening at 3 p.m. Uh, in the Lawrence Heights community. Uh, it's going to be starting at 3 p.m. Uh, at the Lawrence Heights Community Center, uh, which is located at 5 uh, Replin Road. Uh, and so we hope to, uh, that you can join us uh, for this uh, discussion and walk within the community with two excellent uh, resident leaders uh, who will be there. Uh, I think it'll be an extension to the conversation that we've had uh, here today as part of this panel. Uh, and I hope that, you know, we'll also encourage, um, you know, continued discussion and uh, meeting new people, you know, that, you know, share some of the same passions of, you know, uh, learning about the community as well as uh, seeing how, you know, residents can be more involved in, you know, taking ownership and really help to uh, ensure that um, decisions that are made are really focused on the residents. Um, and uh, and so, um, yeah, we really uh, uh, hope that you can enjoy uh, join us uh, for that walk at 3 p.m. Uh, and so before we wrap up, I just want to say finally, thank you again to uh, Jamal, uh, Khairia, Ahmed, and John. Uh, I think it was an excellent panel, um, you know, some really, you know, excellent thoughts um, and, and just really great to hear, you know, so much of the amazing work that you're doing in, within your community uh, as leaders, um, you know, and uh, re I really uh, hope to uh, connect with you and, and, and see how that amazing work continues to evolve uh, over time. And, and so... Uh, without further ado, uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Um, and uh, yeah, have a great day. Thank you. Bye, Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Have a good one, too. Yeah.